This is uh, a very interesting topic for me. Um, it's something that uh, at the Information Commission's office we've been uh, looking at, um, and it's something that I've been interested in for a long time. I'm someone who's um, generally pro-data and pro-data-driven decisions, um, but also um, very interested in the reasons why we might sometimes not want to use uh, data and uh, AI and algorithmic decision making. Um, and so this is kind of focusing on a particular strand of argument. Um, and the connection with explainability, well, I suppose uh, I'm focusing more on the human face. So if you have a decision made about you and you want it to be explained to you, um, one of the reasons that you might want that is that you might want it in human terms. And really, I think what, what people want is that a human can justify the decision and a human can essentially recreate the decision themselves um, rather than kind of deferring to the machine. Um, so this, this is a, really a, an argument about why in some cases we might prefer to have a human making a decision rather than an algorithmic system. And there are kind of lots of different reasons why you might want that. Um, some of them are based on just a pure calculation of you know, economic efficiency. Maybe humans are cheaper and or better at doing something. And there are economic analyses which kind of list um, you know, taxonomies of, of um, business functions and they can say, well, here's the trade-off between employing a human, training them and making them do the decision versus the state-of-the-art uh, systems that you could use. So that's one argument about competence. Another argument is about liability. So uh, maybe some people want humans to be there um, because humans are things that we can hold accountable, things that we can interrogate. Uh, we can ask them to um, justify themselves. We can uh, get them fired if they've made the wrong decision. Um, so that's another set of arguments around liability. And they have kind of interesting consequences around um, when we insert humans into a system which is otherwise automated. So there are, there are um, some of you may be aware of data protection regulations. Um, there's part of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, which says that um, there's a different status for decisions which are based solely on automated decision-making systems. So, so decisions about whether you get a loan or not, um, whether you get invited to an interview at a job, those kinds of decisions, if they're fully automated, so they're completely taken by a machine, then there's an extra level of safeguard and uh, extra barriers um, that are put in place to protect people's rights. Um, another uh, safeguard in that law is that if these decisions are being taken automatically, then people should have the ability to request a human to re-assess uh, the decision and make sure that uh, that they can make the, the human can make the decision for someone rather than a machine. So these are kind of uh, things that are reflected in law that we want sometimes humans to make decisions rather than algorithms. And um, liability and competence are two reasons why we might want them. There's another set of reasons which I think which are kind of the focus of what I'm going to talk about, which are kind of a little bit harder to place your finger on. Um, and a lot of the time they're based on this distinction that's drawn in, in law between rules and discretion. So there's a notion that in some cases there'll be, there'll be rules that dictate in a particular scenario if certain conditions are met that there's a correct decision to be made based on those, on those premises. So for instance, in, if we think about criminal law, um, you have to have the motivation uh, we have to see evidence that someone has the motivation and the means to commit the crime, so the actus reus and the mens rea. Um, and if the, both of those conditions are, are fulfilled, then, then maybe we uh, find the person guilty. Or there might be, you know, to take a more um, you know, in, perhaps entertaining example, there are certain animals which we think are just too dangerous and violent, and we, we think that people shouldn't be able to keep them in domestic circumstances like, say, pit bulls. So we might say, you know, all pit bulls, uh, are, are, if, if you have a pit bull, then, you, then you're not allowed to, um, to keep it in a domestic setting. Okay, so the rules like that, which define, um, you know, how decisions should be made in particular cases, and you can always reliably go from the rule to a decision about the particular case. Um, and then there's a distinction between those kinds of decisions or those areas in, of decision-making and decisions which require discretion. 
So discretionary human judgment. And this means that an individual person who is dealing with the context of the case can say, well, you know, in this case, I mean, normally maybe there would, we would say this person is guilty because there's a motivation and means. Uh, or maybe, you know, in most cases we would ban the, um, we would say that this pit bull isn't, shouldn't be kept. But, you know, in this particular case, maybe there's a mitigating circumstance. Maybe the person had some other reason, which, which means that we won't find them guilty or we, we give them a lesser sentence. Or maybe this particular pit bull is actually a really friendly and cuddly pit bull and we, shouldn't, uh, we should allow the, the owner to keep it. So there are some cases in which we think that people should apply discretion. Um, and this comes up a lot in, in public sector contexts, uh, you know, welfare decisions, um, decisions about you know, who gets uh, which services, where you need to pay attention to the particulars of the case and where we would think that a rule that specified what circumstances lead to which decisions could end up uh, being uh, a kind of a tyrannical formalism. So a, a, a rule that just takes over in, in ways that blatantly are unfair in individual cases. So there's this distinction that's been drawn and there's a, there's a, there are these um, debates within jurisprudence and legal philosophy about um, the, what the status of these different areas of decision making are. And so for some people like um, Dicey, who's um, recently become um, more famous but having been cited um, in, in recent uh, cases with the government, um, Dicey believed that uh, law is all and only rules. So there are no cases in which we should apply discretion. If there are cases where uh, we would disagree with the application of a rule in a particular circumstance, well, then we need to make a new rule that covers that exception. Uh, and if we allow people to make discretionary decisions, then we're um, allowing them to go beyond the law, and that's tyranny. So that was Dicey's position. Um, it's also a distinction that's, that's relied on by um, policymakers when they're thinking about how to regulate the use of um, these kinds of decision-making systems. So um, in 1998, um, the UK was introducing a new social security bill. Um, and it introduced provisions for how decisions about welfare benefits could be allocated. And um, Baroness Hollis, who was a member of the House of Lords, who was speaking on behalf of the government at the time, her argument to reassure the House of Lords was that decisions which require the exercise of discretion or judgment will continue to be made by the department's trained staff. So this was a, a key argument that was put forward and has been put forward in other cases, that this distinction between discretion and rules is a useful guide to where we should allow um, automated or algorithmic decision making to, to be applied. And so this, this distinction is doing a lot of work if we think it's going to guide us in where we should allow um, automated decision making systems. So, where, so that the argument here is that, well, if something can be expressed as a rule and we're comfortable with allowing that rule to dictate decisions in every circumstance in the context that it's, that it's applied to, then we should be happy with automation because automation is able to faithfully apply rules in those ways. So this goes right back to the kind of the, the beginning of artificial intelligence as a research uh, vision or enterprise. Um, so if you go back to um, the 1956, um, the first Dartmouth conference on AI, one of the people who attended that conference was a, um, uh, an academic called Lehman Allen. And at the time, artificial intelligence was based on symbolic uh, approaches to intelligence. So the idea is that uh, you can represent thought in terms of symbols and rules that allow you to derive conclusions from, from symbols. Um, and so Alan at the time thought, well, this would be a great uh, thing to apply to legal decision making. So really this idea of replacing human rule-based bureaucracies with machines goes right back to the beginning of, of AI. Um, so why, why didn't it perhaps reach the, 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 the full potential of the visions that were, that were set out in those times? Um, there were, one of the sort of high points of this, of this enterprise was in the 1980s when um, artificial intelligence researchers were very excited by this um, class of, of AI systems called expert systems. 
And so these were um, essentially, you take a domain, you ask an expert from that domain to tell you everything they know about the domain, and you write up all of the facts and the rules of inference from that domain, and then you allow, you, you, you um, put those facts and rules into a rule base, and then you allow your system to um, reason on your behalf. And so one of the reasons why um, these kind of systems didn't take off was that um, it turned out that in many domains, including the law, it's, it's much more difficult than you might expect to specify all of the rules, all of the exceptions to the rules, all the background assumptions that go into um, actual human decision-making. Um, and, and the law was no exception. So what's changed in the intervening years? Well, one thing that's changed is that dominant approaches to artificial intelligence have uh, changed in, in the last decade or so. So now, um, instead of using expert systems where you explicitly encode um, rules, um, people are relying on machine learning. So machine learning is an approach to artificial intelligence which basically relies on um, showing lots and lots of examples to the computer. And in supervised learning, um, which is a subset of machine learning, those examples have labels with the correct answer. So the examples might be um, job applications, and the labels might be this person was a good candidate for interview or, or this person wasn't a good candidate for interview. And instead of explicitly coding in rules into the system, um, what machine learning approaches do is they build a, a statistical model based on all of the uh, patterns that they've observed between the features of the examples from the historic data and the um, labels that have been applied to them. So these are automatically induced from the data. Um, and so why, why would this be a, uh, why would we think this would be any better as an approach to AI um, and, and legal decision making? Well, one, one reason might be that uh, modern machine learning systems are able to um, uh, incorporate many more features than um, traditional statistical models. And because of that, they hold out the promise that perhaps if what we're concerned about with the rule-based systems was that they, we could never fully specify all of the exceptions because there are so many different features of cases and so many different ways of reasoning from features to conclusions that we can never possibly expect a human to program them in explicitly. Maybe ML holds out the promise of catching all of those exceptions, capturing the underlying rules um, that, that are going on in the mind of the humans who are labeling those instances. So that, that seems like there's a potential um, for these new approaches to AI to, to, to solve those problems. Um, and I think this places those who advocate for, um, uh, for the, limit, the for limits on um, automation on the basis of this distinction between rules and discretion are now on shaky ground because this distinction implicitly associates rule-based expert systems uh, with rules and human judgment with discretion. But what machine learning approaches suggest maybe is that actually what's going on in human discretionary decision making could be captured by these systems. And so if you're a proponent of these systems, you would say, well, sure, I, I can agree that there's a distinction between rules and discretion um, in, in human circumstances, and maybe previous generations of artificial intelligence could only do the rule-based stuff, and even then they couldn't do it very well. But maybe what we could have is a kind of automated discretion where we learn the, uh, whatever it is that the human is doing when they're making their discretionary judgment, we can train a system to learn the same thing. Um, and I think that puts the defender of human judgment on the back foot. Um, and I, I kind of want to equip the, the defender of human judgment with some additional arguments that they could use. Um, so I think when you look at the literature on this, there is kind of reading between the lines. To me, it seemed like there was a kind of an unspoken assumption or an unspoken argument, which I wanted to draw out, which gives a kind of more fundamental in principle reason why we might sometimes not want to take decisions um, using a machine. Um, and that's what I call individual justice. And it's referred to in lots of different ways, in lots of different areas of literature. 
Um, German constitutional lawyers call it Einzelfallgerechtigkeit. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Maybe Germans can correct me. Um, Einzelfallgerechtigkeit means justice in the individual case or justice in the particular case. Um, and there's a notion that this needs to be balanced against justice in the general case. So if we have a rule that applies to everyone, um, that's good because we have, you know, the law is, is something that people can anticipate and can be applied consistently. But if we have only uh, general justice, we miss justice in the individual case. Um, and there are kind of, in, in, you know, there's other trends so in, in, in US law, um, some, some of the constitutional law on, on discrimination cites the notion of uh, that discrimination is wrong because it treats an individual as a member of a class and it, it makes judgments about them on the basis of the activities of other people who are in the same class as them. And that's wrong because it violates some kind of notion of, um, uh, of the, the sort of integrity uh, of, the, of the person. There's also, as well as that kind of... Um, I should say that, that, that actually this notion, this tension between individual justice and general justice goes right the way back to Aristotle. So Aristotle famously said that justice consists in treating like cases alike. So if, if one case is one way and you make a certain decision, then the next case that's the same as that should be given the same decision. So that's general justice. But he also said that there are some things about which it's, un, it's impossible to pronounce rightly um, in general terms. And he said that actually human behaviour is this kind of thing. It's something that, where we can never fully account for it in general terms. So as well as that normative case, there's also, I think, a kind of epistemic case for individual justice, which is based on a certain view of uh, how uh, law works and how language works and the autonomy of law as a particular kind of language. And so this, you can find this in, in, um, in the work of H.L.A. Hart. Hart was influenced by a philosopher called uh, Weizmann. So Weizmann uh, was responding to an early, earlier generation of philosophers, the logical positivists. They believed that language was, uh, could be divided into two buckets. So the first bucket was um, kind of statements that could be proved to be true using math, math and logic. So they were, they, were either, they were analytically true, they could be proved in their own terms. Or they were uh, empirical statements, um, synthetic statements, which could be proved true or false by reference to some kind of empirical test out in the world. You go and you gather some data, you ask someone about you know, who was there at the time of the murder, etc. Um, and they believed that language could be fully specifiable in either of these two terms. And so if, if law was the same, then that suggests at least logically that we could have a system, uh, an automated system that would automatically apply um, sentences about the law to particular cases in a definitive way. And we'd always have the answer as long as we had the ability to reason mathematically or go and find things out about the world, we would always um, be able to, to come to the right answer in a specific case. But, but um, Hart and Weizmann said, no, actually, language is different. The terms that we use in language are always open to negotiation. So obviously there are some terms in language which are already vague, so a word like a heap or a pile. The difference between a heap and a pile is kind of blurry, and we already know that they're blurry. But there are also terms which right now seem very definite, th things that we, we all agree on their meaning. Until we see an example which confounds our existing notion of how the term should apply. So Weizmann uses the example of a cat, we all know what a cat is. We all would respond the same if we saw uh, examples of cats and dogs. We'd know how to distinguish between the two of them. But Weizmann says, well, what if there was a case, hypothetical case, where a cat became immortal or a cat grew to be the size of the Turing Institute? Right? In, that, in that case, maybe we, we would start to disagree about whether the term cat applied to this particular cat. So language is always dynamic and open to interpretation, and that's especially true in the law. So that's a kind of... Um, linguistic or epistemic thesis as to why individual justice is required. Now, what does this have to do with algorithmic decision making? Well, even if you have a machine learning system which is trying to capture um, all the different nuances of all the different cases, all of, enca uh, encapsulate all of the features that might um, be used to derive a decision, even then there is a limited uh, number of features that you can consider in any decision. And if two new cases share exactly the same features, 
then your model will always give the same output, right? So for that reason, you, even in a system which, which, which uh, encapsulates all of the exceptions you can think of, there always might be another exception. There always might be a mitigating circumstance. There always might be another form of logic that could take you from a set of features to a conclusion. So I think this equips the defenders of human judgment with a kind of more fundamental argument against the use of algorithmic decision making. And I think it's a very awkward conclusion because it essentially says that by definition, algorithmic decision making systems violate this notion of individual justice. And so for that reason, I think you know, in many cases, individual justice will be far too strong. It will, if, you, if you are completely dedicated to it, you won't be able to have any kind of algorithmic decision making systems at all. But maybe that's right for certain circumstances in which the, the integrity of, of the individual or in which uh, we're very concerned about to maintain the dynamism and the negotiated nature of language. Maybe in those cases, it's right that we uh, always defer to human judgment.